welcome to CB8 Speaks. My name is Alita Camp. I'm your host for today, and I am delighted to welcome Abraham Salcedo. He's the chair of Community Board 8 Street Life Committee, a tough job. Welcome, Abraham. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Alita. I'm happy to be here. Good. I'd like to start out by asking you a little bit about your background. Where are you from? I'm born and raised uh, in Los Angeles. Um, that's where my family still resides. And I moved to New York 24 years ago, in 1998, uh, just a, a wee 18-year-old that I moved out here for college. Um, and I fell in love with New York, and I never went back. What do you love about New York? I love the energy. I love, I love that it's always changing and it's always new. You know, I can walk down the same street and I have year after year and it's always different. I really like the diversity of people here, the ability to just do just about anything, whether I want to go to a museum, catch a show, see a concert, and just go for a walk. It's always nice and enjoyable and fun. And I will say that being from Los Angeles and now that we're here in the holiday season, I remember as a little kid, I always would hope for snow for Christmas. <laughs> Obviously, I never got it in Los Angeles, but what I do like about being here in New York is I like, I like the seasons. I really, it makes, for me, it makes it really appreciate the time that you have, whether it's the sweltering heat of the summer or the, the chill of, of the winter. Well, I'm glad that you're here and you liked college, so you decided to stay for all of those reasons, but I bet your family misses you a lot. Yeah, but thankfully I'm, I'm I have the ability, I've been able to, like, you know, I go out regularly. Um, you know, I, for the most part, I have not missed the Thanksgiving or Christmas, so I always kind of go out and spend time with them. I have my parents, uh, my sister, my brother. I have two little nephews that I like to spend time oh, with and go fine. see. Uh, so it's always really, it's always really enjoyable to go back. Uh, and, you know, people have always asked me, like, which do I prefer, L.A. or New York? And even though I'm here, you know, that I prefer New York. But I've never felt like I've ever lacked either. I've always felt like I've had both because I still have a you know, core group of good friends from like high school still that I see regularly when I go out there. So I've been very fortunate to have both. So what made you interested in joining the community board? I knew that I wanted to always find a way to like give back in some way. So when I was, when I was in law school, my law school and several others kind of banded together and we did some like legal relief work down uh, at Post Katrina in New Orleans, and that was really rewarding. And then I also uh, participated in some of like the, the law school clinics of helping uh, individuals with unemployment claims, or uh, I started the uh, environmental law clinic at, at Fordham, uh, where I went to law school. So just always trying to find ways to be active and, and kind of give back in some way. Ashamedly, uh, I didn't know about community boards before I joined, which I feel like is one of the things that I I feel like people kind of get annoyed with me because like, I just like to tell them about community boards out, you know, unsolicitedly. But I lived in London for a little bit uh, for work. I got relocated. Then I came back and I wanted to find a way to just kind of reimmerse myself into the city and kind of be able to do, do something. So I was talking to a couple of friends and, and one of them is the one that told me about community boards. He's like, you know, it's a really good way to kind of get involved, be able to like really build community. So I did. And that was back in 2013. I applied and... I was fortunate to be selected, um, and it's been, yeah, I guess I'm, April will be 10 years that I've now been uh, on the board, so it's quite a, it's gone quickly. I can't believe that it's been that long, but it's been great. Does London have anything like community boards? Not in the same way they have, because they have like councils, and there is some participation, but I didn't find anything comparable. Yeah. For those who don't know, community boards are the most local level of New York City government, yeah. and it is a great way to be involved and to become knowledgeable about what's going on in the city and even the state government. We don't really deal with federal so much, but as at the Street Life Committee is advisory to the State Liquor Authority yes. for liquor licenses. So would you talk a little bit about what your committee does and why you chose to become chair? And because your committee is so busy and so active, there are always multiple resolutions for every board meeting, how you handle all of that. Yeah, it's, it's a very busy committee. Aside from our meetings, there's always constituent questions and, and, uh, and concerns raised. Uh, we advise and we support and we hear applications for uh, liquor license applications, whether it's liquor, wine, beer. There's a couple of different varieties of types of licenses, but we hear those applications and we, you know, we listen to the, the applicants. We listen to their hours of operation. There's a need to kind of suggest some mitigating mechanisms, we do that, whether it's to be preemptive about noise or 
they're an establishment that's looking to have kind of live music. So we, we take all of that into account and kind of, you know, supporting the applications. We're, we're always obviously trying to be supportive of any establishment wanting to come and be in our neighborhood. Um, so it's really kind of like a, an open conversation back and forth. Pre-COVID, we also, we do hear, but it, it's changed a bit, the sidewalk, uh, sidewalk uh, cafe applications. Um, so pre-COVID, we heard all of those to make sure that, you know, whether it's the size, the clearances for those applications, obviously now it's a little different because we have the kind of the open streets program. Um, so we also then hear uh, applicants who want to take advantage of the, the sidewalk uh, seatings. Uh, and then a new area that we're going to be delving into is um, with the new Office of Cannabis Management, the applications for um, for marijuana licenses. Uh, well, that should be interesting. So that's new for all of us. The OCM is still working through their regulations and kind of what they want to do. But once that kind of goes fully live, we'll be uh, hearing those applications as well and kind of, you know, um, trying to apply the same kind of transparency and just kind of clarity to applicants as well as members of the public. And then lastly, one of the other areas that we do do advise on is the new stands. So you see like the, the new stands that are kind of scattered throughout. So we also hear those applications. Um, so it's, as you can see, it, it, it's busy and it, it promises to get busier. A lot busier, yeah. I would think. I know that came up at the full board meeting the other night about right. enforcement. What has been the most unusual idea that anyone had for a venue? Oh, gosh. One of the most challenging ones I remember was maybe four or five years ago where an establishment was trying to present themselves more as a a restaurant, but they were also kind of like a hookah kind of lounge. Oh, I remember yeah. that. It was challenging because, again, we want to be supportive, but it became clear once they opened that they were more interested in being more of like a, a club. There's time and place for that, but this particular venue wasn't that. So it was a little disingenuous in their application. And we got a lot of feedback from the neighbors about the hours and, and such. So uh, we had to really kind of you know, reach out to them and then also just work with our elected officials and, and, and even the NYPD because it became a little bit out of hand. So that's been one of the interesting and challenging ones. Um, you know, and then you have other venues that, you know, we had a couple applications for more like private members clubs as well, which I think, uh, you know, also involves a lot of input because people are, you know, understandably want to be comfortable where they live and but then mindful of, you know, the type of establishment that's opening. So uh, I think those are those are two that come to mind as kind of the most involved ones that we've had. No, I remember it's a lot yeah. of work. The public comes and expresses its either content or discontent with various establishments. What has been, um, let's say, the most unusual or the most difficult complaint to deal with? Yeah, I think first and foremost, you know, our role is to provide, you know, access to the public, right? That's kind of, our, we're advisory, but the whole um, kind of purpose is to allow public comment. And uh, so always want to make everyone feel heard, um, you know, and, and I think it's also challenging sometimes because not everyone fully understands how we operate or what we do or the scope of what we can do. Um, so I try to kind of explain that, uh, you know, kind of at the outset of, of the committee meetings because I think it's important to know because I don't ever want anyone to walk away disappointed because they had a different expectation of what we could do versus what we, what we actually have uh, the authority to do. The comments are interesting because obviously you have noise complaints, hours of operation, um, and we have different types of um, things that we take into account. So for example, if, if a new establishment is opening on an avenue, you know, avenues, it's, it's more understandable that things are maybe open later or there's going to be a little more noise as opposed to a side street. Um, one of the most interesting one that I had was there was a, uh, there was like an odor complaint. I guess there was some kind of ventilation issue with one establishment and it was somehow seeping into uh, into the building of, of the, the residents that were upstairs. Um, you know, something that don't always think about, but I guess whenever they created the space for this venue, they, the ventilation wasn't what it should be. Um, so that was that was an interesting one. And it, it took some a lot of moving pieces to kind of get it responded to between the establishment and they had to talk to the building and we had to you know, keep communicating with the, the residents just to let them know that, you know, it, it was getting worked on. But uh, that's that's that was one. You know, and then there's always there's always some kind of noise complaints and we try to address that by, you know, we make sure that the establishments, you know, have their doors and windows closed by 10 p.m. so that there's a quality of life. 
we have to take into account if there's any kind of rear yard in the establishment because of kind of the echoing that can happen with the uh, the enclosed of the building. So there's always a lot to contemplate. It's tough to balance the needs of the residents. How are you, let's say, trained for for chairing the committee? So I mean, I had really great mentors uh, when I when I started kind of participating in street life. Uh, the, the chairs then were Nico Minerva and Jonathan Horn, who just really were very welcoming and that just did a very great job of kind of explaining. I can't think of anyone that was more knowledgeable than Jonathan, like he knew the insides and outs of all the applications. Uh, so that was really great to learn from. And then even now, Cos Bagnelletti, you know, he's been on the board for many, many years and he's, uh, he's always been a good mentor and, and, and very supportive. So that helped a lot. And then I think my, my experience as, as an attorney, I'm, a, I'm an attorney, I think that helps because, you know, there's, there's always a lot of listening and kind of taking all sides into account. So I always try to be mindful of that, that, you know, everyone's going to have an opinion, everyone's going to have emotions, uh, but at the end of the day, everyone should be heard uh, constructively. And, you know, and then just try, and as you said, trying to balance, you know, I think in my, in my profession, like there is a lot of balancing and taking into account all factors and kind of coming up with the, the most constructive solution if possible. Um, so I think that's, that's where we are. So again, we're, we're, so, we want to be supportive of any business that wants to come in and be a good neighbor and work with us. And I think that's, that's what we try to convey. And at the same time, we want to be respectful of the neighbors and understand what their concerns are. So it, it's really just about fostering that dialogue. And I think that's a big role of us because oftentimes you have a constituent who might be frustrated and because they haven't maybe they don't have a relationship or they haven't been able to get in contact with someone at the establishment. So like a big part of what we do is kind of bringing people together because maybe there was a misunderstanding or someone didn't appreciate the level of the concern. So I think that that's really a big part of what we do, just kind of bring all the voices together to come up with some solution. Zoom has had a big impact on the way the board functions. Have you seen relationships between the committee and either the public who has concerns or is happy to have an establishment and the establishment, has that changed? And that also brings me to the question of before we were on Zoom, when we were meeting in person, were there any altercations between a frustrated restaurant and customer or a frustrated customer or a member of the public and, uh, and a bar owner, for instance, who wasn't being responsive? Was there any physical or really contentious kinds of meetings and how has that changed with Zoom? Yeah, so I'll say no. I think beforehand I did not come across any kind of real contentious. You, you would have people that would speak at the public session in person and, and kind of voice their concerns, but I don't have any particular instead of any kind of real like animosity or, or interaction between an established uh, establishment owner uh, and, and a member of the public. I think for what Zoom has done, well, it has provided a lot of benefit in the sense that it's proved, created or allowed for more accessibility. I mean, more people can join because not everyone can necessarily come to the meetings when they were in person for a variety of reasons. Or, you know, now with Zoom, like someone can kind of pop in, you know, for, for a period of time. So I think that has been great in the sense of allowing more people to participate. But I think what it has also created is that it's separated us a little bit. Again, we're not in person, we're not here. And I think someone is less likely to be a little more, I'll say, forceful in their expressing of feelings in person than they might be behind a screen. Uh, that's just kind of kind of the, the culture we're in right now in terms of like being behind a, a computer screen. So I, I've seen a little more people express their emotions over Zoom. And I think that's a big part of why at the outset of my meetings, I, I just remind people because uh, it's, it's a simple thing, but just reminding like, look, we, we're all here to be heard, but let, you know, we need to make sure that we're respectful of each other, that there's a certain level of decorum, you know, because everyone's opinion is, is valid, but sometimes emotions can get the best of us. And, uh, but it, that's why I try to remind people that, you know, even though we're, we're not here in person, we're over Zoom, that should be top of mind. It's definitely important. And it's been a big issue on the, the, at the whole board level as well. As well. Yeah. Thank you for, for mentioning that. Yeah. I think at the whole board, like, yeah, I, I remember going to meetings and it was always great, you know, seeing you and seeing other interacting uh, with, with the board and help foster like that closer relationship. But now we've had a couple of cycles of new members that I've never had the opportunity to meet in person yet, which is kind of unfortunate. And so I, I would like to see in the future some kind of you know I, hybrid model where we have the opportunity to connect in person, uh, but still keep the, the Zoom aspect because I think it does add value to, um, to allow people to participate when they might not otherwise.
Yeah, we've had board meetings with almost 200 people. Yeah. And that's that's a big number. And it's good to have that kind of public involvement. And also because what you do is so responsive immediately to public concerns and also to an open dialogue, as you mentioned, with a restaurant owner or a bar num or a bar owner yeah. and the public and the board. Um, you've been on the board. You said you're coming up on your 10th anniversary. Yeah. How have you seen a change in other than the Zoom impact? I think one of the things that I've seen change, especially I think it was specifically under our previous council member, Ben Kalos, I think there was an effort to provide change to the board because there were a lot of very senior members on the board, which, which is good. But I think the approach was to try to diversify the experience level uh, with, you know, we, we they lowered the age level to have, um, you know, younger members of the, of the board, which I think is great to have that insight. So I've seen that change. I've seen it uh, kind of demographically more diverse, uh, which I also think is good to have voices from all levels and socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, so I think that's the biggest change. Do uh, high school kids or early college students who are below the drinking age, do they, how do they, do they respond differently to issues that come up at Street Life? Yes, but not in, I feel that they're, they're very thoughtful of it, even though it's like, you know, not they're not allowed to drink, but like, I think they're, I think maybe because of that, they're a lot more thoughtful and, and, and inquisitive as to like the different considerations that we have, um, which is very kind of refreshing. Um, and it's, it's good input. I've been very impressed with every single kind of youth uh, member that we, that we've had since they kind of started with the, the lowering the age limit. That's great. Are they actually, do they just come to your meetings from the board or are they members of the Street Life Committee? Uh, a little bit of both. I do have a couple of members, but uh, yeah, no, we have people that come in and just kind of participate regularly. Hearing different perspectives brings, I guess, a broader approach or a, a different, more thoughtful or covering different angles approach yeah. to, to working with people because the Street Life Committee, it's not about policy, it's about individuals and their their um, establishments, as well as the individuals who may be negatively impacted by those. Right. Yeah, no, very much so. like we have guidelines and rules, you know, set out by the SLA in terms of proximity of establishment. But at the end of the day, it really comes down to how can we help continuing to cultivate a prosperous community and also a, a quality of life aspect. And for our committee, a lot of the work is, you know, done at the meetings, but there's a, a lot of behind the scenes stuff. And we get a lot of constituent questions or comments, complaints, et cetera, that get filtered through the board office. So like there's a lot of just kind of responding to emails uh, and, and questions around that that happens, which is more than one would think, but I think it's it's important. And I also make it a point that, you know, I've had, you know, constituents, if, if, you know, if they run into me on the street that had a question, I'm like, great, but like I actually encourage them to send everything through the board office because again, we're a public entity. So I wanna make sure that there's transparency uh, and I would never want there to be any kind of even uh, potential inference of having like, you know, ex party conversations, as we say, uh, in, in the legal world. But so I like to have everything through through the board office so that there's a one, there's a record for whoever, whomever reaches out that they, they, they submitted a request or a question. And then that was responded to. And I think that's that's important as well. I would agree with you. And uh, one of the things about the community board is just the accessibility of the board and the various committee chairs and members of the board to the public. It's, um, it's a shame that not enough people know about community boards. Yes. Do you have any suggestions about how that could be overcome and more people could know? Yeah. I think one of the things we can continue to leverage is you know, we have our younger members who are in schools. I think leveraging them to kind of you know, speak to their classmates about uh, about community boards would be helpful it's just so that we start getting people up to speed earlier um, but yeah I think there's there's more outreach we can and should do and I'd be happy to uh, to do as well is everything from you know attending you know our neighborhood association meetings flyering at establishments that have like bulletin boards uh, using our, our libraries that we have a good relationship with and then on top of that which is things that you know we do ourselves is just when we talk to people it's like hey do you know what this let me let me tell you about you know this thing that exists. Um, so I, I think it's an it's an ongoing effort uh, as as a board. We, there's a lot of opportunities that we can take advantage of more because, uh, as we said, like I think not everyone's going to be interested, but I think a lot more people than we suspect are going to be curious as to like how the workings of our community is. I mean, it's been a whole new world uh, when I joined. Of like I know more about uh, you know 
how the community works and things operate than I ever thought I, I would. Exactly. Uh, and and it's it's fascinating, really, in a lot of ways. It is, and being on the community board for me too has just exposed me to a lot more inner workings of the of the city government and the state government too. You said that you're a lawyer and that some of the skills that you employ in your practice or your work, yeah. you are able to bring over to the community board. Would you like to talk a little bit more about what it is you do every day? Because there are lots of different kinds of lawyers. Yeah, I'm kind of a corporate digital technology lawyer. I'm currently in-house counsel at the Boston Consulting Group, uh, specifically in their kind of digital ventures arm. So in short, we have a lot of smart people that effectively build some kind of technology, whether it's a, a tool, a product, or even help other companies launch a new company. I like to say we build startups for bigger companies. There's a lot that goes into that from the legal standpoint, just from you know putting putting a contract in place, navigating complex intellectual property issues, mitigating risk, uh, and then I also even get involved in some of the commercial, like uh, helping them how to structure the deal. Um, I have a, I have a, in my prior life, I have a kind of accounting finance background, so that also comes in handy to to help to help with that. So. What I really enjoy about it is that no day is the same. I never know what to expect. I like variety, so it's always good to to be able to do that. And and really, I really enjoy when I see kind of the finished product uh, once once the company is launched or the product is launched. You know, I'll get an update. You know, a couple months later, hey, this thing that we built, you know, is now like you know, amassed a good market share or like you know, it, you know, it's it, it's reached some other milestone. So it's always kind of good to know that you helped play a role in that. Um, so I think that's rewarding. As to what that helps me bring to the table here, a lot of the same things of like just really listening and taking into account all of the different moving pieces because there are both in the legal world as there are here in, in, in the community board of, you know, all right, what are we thinking about? What are we not thinking about? Um, and I think that's where having a lot of voices in the room is helpful. And then also being able to try to bring people together and kind of bridge, you know, while there might be different views or, or things like that, of kind of like coming to a sensible, uh, best possible conclusion to something. Uh, so I think those are kind of skills that, that come in handy. Um, you know, and then, then you know, the, obviously the technical aspect, obviously I kind of the being able to understand and read through some of the, uh, the legalese of things, you know, you know the, for example, like the Office of Cannabis Management, like the new regulations. Those are very long, long uh, regulations, but uh, yeah, so that, that comes in handy as well you talk about security or risks. Mm -hmm. Are you also talking about digital security and risks? And I bet some of the lessons that you've learned or imparted to your clients are useful for the public as well. Mm -hmm. um, have you seen a change in issues relating to digital security? It is not specifically my specialty. Thankfully, I have a uh, kind of like a, we have our internal kind of cybersecurity team that deals with the, the details of those types of things. But what I can do is, you know, when, when we come across those questions, uh, I, you know, I try to pre-identify kind of risk and exposure and things like that, because obviously everything is now digital, right? So it's it's very important dealing with customer data, employee data, and, and then just the ever-evolving regulations. So uh, I I defer to, to the experts on that, but uh, I'm able to know enough to be able to identify kind of when those things need to be raised. I think the landscape for that has changed as well, where yeah. it's it's much more of an issue and a concern than it used to be. Very much so, I think, as we've seen with the, the, the regulations coming out in California for privacy uh, that have you know, kind of been modeled after the European ones. And we're, we're seeing more and more states do that. So it's, it's, it's something that's just now an ever-present kind of topic. Have you seen the community change since the time that you moved here 24 years ago? I imagine that you have. In what ways have you seen a change? And have you always lived in the same apartment? Because in New York, neighborhoods are different. And 96th Street, which is the northern border of the community board, is different than 60th Street, which is the southern end. Right. So after I graduated college, I lived in Midtown East. So I was on 54th between 1st and 2nd for about eight years, from 2002 to 2008, so I guess six years. Um, and then I had my short stint in London, and then I moved back to New York in 2011, uh, and I've been here on the Upper East Side since then, it's in the same place. I'm on 79th in New York. If anyone wants to come say hello. Um, and but even before that, actually, I did have a lot of exposure to the Upper East Side because at the time I just had a lot of friends that were up here. I've seen change, I think, and especially during COVID, we saw a lot of you know places unfortunately like kind of close. But it's been very good to kind of see things coming back. So I've seen a lot of more applications, new establishments opening. So that's been great. I think the the thing that I enjoy most about kind of the Upper East Side is that it 
for as big as New York City is, it, it does feel very community-esque. Like it feels, whether it's, it, you run into the same people regularly just walking down the street after, after having been here so long, or just walking down the street and like, and I know, I say hi to the doorman, not of my building, but just like, because I walk down the same street every day. So there is a very good community feel here that I really enjoy. And, you know, being on New York, I like the fact that, you know, it's, I'm close to the river, so it's a little quiet. But at the same time, activity is never too far away because I just got to walk one avenue or two to get, you know, good restaurants uh, or a place to have a drink. And, you know, we're, we're not far from the park. Now, I have to agree. Second Avenue has really exploded yeah. with restaurants and a whole variety. Now, I remember reading that Filipino nurses started a restaurant on First Avenue because they couldn't get breakfast after they finished their shift during oh, wow. COVID. And I went there and I ran into another former board member, Trisha, oh, there. Okay. Okay. So, do you go over to the East River Esplanade? That's one of my favorite places walking over to, to the East River, whether it's for just taking a walk and you know, kind of sitting on, in Carl Schroes Park and just enjoying the views uh, or going for a run. That's one of my, kind of one of my activities. So it's a great place to do that. And then going over the bridge into uh, Randall's and Wars Island. So I do, I do very much enjoy the, the East side and I will be very happy once they finish the work so that we can have a, <laughs> a straight line down as opposed to uh, having to do a little diversion. Yeah, no, it's nice. Whenever I'm at the es Esplanade, the ability to look over at Queens and watch the river and the boat traffic and the plantings, it's, it's beautiful. That actually brings me back to a little bit of, you had asked me before, like how things have changed. So obviously 24 years ago, we didn't have like the Q train. So I think that the Q provided a, a big, a lot more access to, to this neighborhood, which is great. And then also the, um, the ferries, I think have been a really great addition. So now being able to hop over to Roosevelt Island or, or to Queens in like five minutes uh, or all the way downtown. It's been another really great access point, which I think has opened this area up uh, quite a bit. Oh, the ferry is fantastic. I took it going downtown all the way to South Street Seaport, mm -hmm. and you really see the shape of Manhattan in a way that you don't see it any place else. Yeah. It's fantastic that you do half marathons and full marathons. When did you start doing that and how do you train? Um, I've been a runner for as long as I can remember. I started in, in high school unwittingly. I, you know, I was in PE class, you know, as a freshman and they, you know, whatever, twice a year, they had us run a mile for time. Turns out I was pretty good at it. So the PE coach called me over and says, I want to introduce you to someone. And he introduced me to the, the track and cross country coach wow. at the time. And he's like, we're, we're drafting you. So I kind of got drafted into being a runner and, and it's been great. Um, you know, I, I've really enjoyed it. I mean, I, I do prefer I was more of a track runner uh, in high school. I also ran at NYU. Yes, uh, which, I was going to ask yeah, you. Yeah, uh, which was also a really great experience, be, especially being new to New York. It was a great opportunity to kind of have a community. Um, and I really got to see a lot of the Northeast and a good part of the country just because NYU, our division, was a very uh, diverse division. So, for example, we got to compete against University of Chicago or Brandeis or Emory. Uh, so we got to uh, you know, travel to those places, which was a lot of fun. So that really was a whole new world. And then now these days, I do prefer some of the shorter races, like 5Ks, 10Ks. Yeah, so I have, I've done maybe three or four half marathons. I did two this year. I've done the New York City Marathon once in 2006, and I'm actually doing it again in 2023. Oh, fantastic. Um, the training element is a couple of fold. Obviously, you kind of go out on runs on yourself, but I think what's helped me, especially during COVID, I joined two running groups, which have been helpful just to, again, build community. I think that's kind of the common theme that I think helps a lot of things get done. So having people to go run with, and just look forward to that helps, uh, especially on those days when you may or may not want to, you know, bear the cold on your own. But I enjoy it because it's a good, obviously, it's good for your health, being stronger and kind of healthier, but also just kind of the, the mental element. Uh, it's, it's just sometimes when you go out on a run for your own, it's just time to really kind of think or, or not think, depending on kind of where you are in the day. So uh, I find it quite therapeutic. I think Marathon Day is one of the best days of the year here in New York, and especially on the Upper East Side, just seeing First Avenue just filled with people being so supportive and it's so inspiring from the elite runners to individuals who do it on crutches and it's just it's yeah. so inspiring to see that and, and equally inspiring to how just supportive everyone is and just cheering on people that you don't even know but just like you know seeing the names on the on the bibs or on their on their attire and you know go John go Dan go Alice whomever and it's just really really uplifting yeah people are pleased to share the city and excited when people come and want them to like it, whether right. they're from a different neighborhood or a different state or a, a different country. And so 
that kind of quick to help or give directions is part of that. I want you to love my city kind of thing. Very much so. Very much so. Yeah, no, I mean, I think we're, we're, we're proud of our city because it is a great place and we want everyone to kind of really see it. That's always nice. And I think that, again, Marathon Day is like almost like the, the height of that where you see everyone just out in full force to supporting locals or, uh, or non-locals. If you could think that far back mm -hmm. that you went uh, with your track team from college, what's your favorite other than New York and Los Angeles city? that you've been to oh, or place. Uh, I'll give the, the U.S. version. So a couple of cities that I really enjoy. I really like San Francisco. I think San Francisco is beautiful uh, being by the bay. It's not New York, but I think it's about as close as I can get to New York in terms of the skyline, big buildings, kind of the energy. I really enjoy New Orleans. Uh, I, I love the, again, having, having done the kind of the volunteer work down there, it, it had a, a special place in my heart because of it, but also just the people are really warm, welcoming. Uh, the food is oh. top notch. And then internationally, obviously, I lived in London, so I, London holds a special place in my heart. Uh, and lastly, Paris. I've, I, I, I've just always enjoyed something special about Paris. It's been, it's been really great. Uh, well, I can say that this has just been a really terrific conversation with you. I thank you so much for being here and sharing your background, your views, all the hard work that you do for the community and the community board and your clients. They must yeah. be very appreciative. It's just been very interesting to hear all about your background, your interests. I thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here and I'm glad to have been able to speak with you. And thank you everyone for tuning in and thank you to Manhattan Neighborhood Network for hosting us. See you again.